Thank you, Steve, and my thanks also to the Peterson family for your generosity toward the museum and also in particular toward this lecture program. I will be speaking to you tonight primarily about the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, which as most of you know is located in southwestern Turkey. But I'll have occasion to discuss most of the seven wonders of the ancient world in the course of the evening. And this is a motley group of monuments, as you know. Two statues, two tombs, a temple, a lighthouse, some gardens. One wouldn't normally have thought of putting all of these on a single list, but they were put on a single list probably in the third century BC and probably in Alexandria in Egypt. And they came to constitute a kind of standard of excellence that every successive generation attempted to meet and surpass. And it's a great shame that only one of them, the Great Pyramids of Giza, still remains standing, but we're reminded of the great wonders of the ancient world on a daily basis, even though often we're not really familiar uh, that we're being reminded. But for example, every time you look at the Statue of Liberty, you're in fact looking at something that was heavily influenced by the Colossus of Rhodes, which was created in the, uh, on the island of Rhodes in the early third century BC. They're in fact the same height, and with the same radiant crown, although the Statue of Liberty looks higher because the pedestal is higher. But in essence, it's the same basic idea, uh, a salute to the sun god, which in the case of the Statue of Liberty has been given the attributes of liberty, but at core is the sun god. So we'll look at the influence of the seven wonders of the ancient world just as much as we'll look at the seven wonders of the ancient world in their original manifestation. Now, in order to do the, in order to look at the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, we have to direct our attention toward southwestern Turkey and toward the kingdom of Caria, C-A-R-I-A. This was not an independent kingdom, really. It was part of the Persian Empire. Now, as many of you know, the Persians, as of the middle of the sixth century BC, created an empire that stretched from what is now southeastern Europe to what is now Afghanistan. And that empire lasted for a little over two centuries. One of the reasons it was so successful is because the Persians were very good at recognizing, were giving a large degree of autonomy to the subject states that were part of their empire. And that included the satrapy, or subject state, of Caria. Caria had two different capitals. Originally, the capital was Milasa, and I'm going to talk to you about some recent discoveries in Milasa, also focused on funerary monuments. And then subsequently, a little later in the fourth century BC, changed to Halicarnassus. And for the majority of the lecture, we will be in the fourth century BC, in the late classical period. Many of you have been to Halicarnassus, but you know it by its modern name of Bodrum. And I'll discuss also the etymology of that word and its link to the mausoleum of Halicarnassus a little later. So with the Carian dynasty, or as we often say, the Hecatomnid dynasty of King Mausolus, what kind of a dynasty are we dealing with? This was a dynasty that's most famous in the first half of the fourth century BC. And you see the dates here for Mausolus ruling in the second quarter of the fourth century BC. This was a dynasty that, like Pharaonic Egypt, practiced consanguineous marriage. That means brother married sister. And so the wife of Mausolus was his sister, Artemisia. And his father was a man named Hecatomnus, who gave his name to the dynasty. So therefore, the Hecatomnid dynasty, and we'll be focusing on Mausolus and Artemisia because they are the builders of the mausoleum, this great monumental tomb that was constructed in the middle of the fourth century BC so that the name of Mausolus would be famous forever, as indeed it has been. We don't actually know what Mausolus and Artemisia looked like. These two statues, now in the British Museum, originally decorated the mausoleum, and many have identified them as Mausolus and Artemisia, but these are two of 36 statues representing the family, the entire dynasty of Hecatomnus. So we can't actually pin names on these two figures, but for our purposes, let's say they're Mausolus and Artemisia, just so that you have an image on which to focus. So although Mausolus was subject to the Persian Empire, 
he had not an independent kingdom, but a kingdom with a great deal of autonomy. And so he ruled uh, all of what is now southwestern Turkey and also the island of Rhodes. And in fact, when he died, the island of Rhodes thought that they could seek their independence from Carian control. And so they apparently assumed that with Artemisia, his wife and sister, the only one on the throne, they could probably be fairly successful in fomenting a, a revolution that would gain, th that would give them their independence. And so they sent a force to Halicarnassus, not understanding that Artemisia was a force with which to be reckoned. And she, uh, through a series of very clever tricks, not only defeated the Rhodian invaders, but sent ships to Rhodes. They were greeted by the Rhodians because you have Carian fighters in Rhodian ships. And she gained an even stronger control on the island of Rhodes than even her husband had, and allegedly had a triumphal group of herself set up in bronze that showed Artemisia in bronze sitting on a personification of the island of Rhodes, branding it with a branding iron, which is unprecedented in the history of triumphal imagery. It's not unlikely that at some point in the 560s, Mazolus decided to build a colossal tomb for himself. Now you couldn't wait until the last minute to build these tombs because death often comes unexpectedly. So most of the monarchs would start their tombs while they were still in the pink of health, especially if it were a monumental tomb, so that it was guaranteed to be finished in time. And of course there were wars going on all the time, so you never knew when your last day would dawn. Although we're told from, by the ancient sources that the mausoleum wasn't finished until after Mausolus' death, so at the time in which Artemisia was ruling as the queen of Caria. In order to understand the significance of the mausoleum, we need to step back for a minute and look at the history of funerary monuments for royalty in Anatolia, in ancient Turkey, during the first millennium BC, because this is something off of which the mausoleum is bouncing. This is the kind of intellectual baggage that Mazolus had in his mind when he commissioned the mausoleum. So coincidentally, the first of the monumental tombs for Anatolian kings, for Anatolian royalty, comes in the 8th century BC at the site of Gordian in central Turkey, which has been excavated under the auspices of this museum since 1950, and where I now have the honor of directing those excavations. As many of you know, when Rodney Young, formerly of this museum, excavated in the 1950s, he found the tomb through a process of trial and error, the tomb chamber that he thought was Midas, Midas allegedly of the Golden Touch. We would now recognize it as the tomb of Midas' father, probably a man named Gordius. But he excavated the tomb, which was determined to date to about 740 BC. And as he went into the tomb, he found the oldest standing wooden structure in the world. Here is the tomb chamber of Midas dating to 740 BC. Now this monument was the biggest monument for a king in Turkey for a period of nearly 200 years. There had been plenty of other monuments for kings, uh, funerary markers, but none this monumental. This is 53 meters high. That's 170 feet high. Some of you know the Buddhas carved in the cliffs of central Afghanistan that were blown up by the Taliban in 2001. Those were 170 feet high, 53 meters. So this is an identical height just colossal, and it wasn't superseded until the early 6th century BC when the Lydian king Croesus comes to the throne of Sardis, the ruler of the Lydian kingdom, as you see here in what is now central and western Turkey. And just as Midas had done, he built uh, a burial monument for his father, which you see here. His father's name was Aliates, and he built it 15 meters higher than the one that Midas had built. So trying to make it even more impressive than one of the earlier kings. They're all conscious of the size and scope and decoration of the earlier monuments, and they're all trying to supersede those, to match them and surpass them. 
these tomb chambers that were built by the Lydian kings were different from the ones built by the Phrygian kings. The Phrygian chambers were wooden, with these enormous piles of earth on top of them. The Lydians recognized that stone would be a better material for such enormous tumuli or such enormous burial mounds. And so we get these monumental chambers of stone elaborately painted that fortunately still survive. And this is one of the more recently excavated ones in Lydia. And gradually, the kings in what is now Bulgaria and Macedonia in northeastern Greece recognized that they should be building monumental burial mounds, monumental tumuli as well. And some of these have been excavated, as you know, over the last few decades in both Macedonia, uh, in northeastern Greece, and in what is now southeastern Bulgaria, the most famous of which come from Vergina, the so-called tomb of Philip II where you actually have a building made of stone that looks like a temple. So you can see the columns, the uh, triglyph and metope frieze, and then another painted frieze on the top showing a, uh, a hunt. Hunts and battles are continually associated with funerary monuments, as we'll see in a minute. And in these Macedonian tombs, what was found were phenomenal treasures. You see the gold uh, larnax, in, which contained the bones of the deceased wrapped in purple and golden cloth, as well as a crown. These golden crowns are also a standard feature of funerary assemblages. So it wasn't just the size of the tomb chamber, it was also the material that was dedicated within that chamber that the king or queen could take with them into the afterlife. This, uh, of course, dates to the latter part of the fourth century BC, um, just after the um, mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Now, if we go back to Anatolia, Thus far, you've seen these big burial mounds, one in Phrygia, in Gordian for Midas, and one in Lydia, in Sardis, for the father of Croesus. Around about 400 BC, in southwestern Turkey, they vary the kind of funerary monument that they're building. They start carving them out of the rock, out of the native rock, on the cliffs past which one would sail as one sailed through the Aegean Sea. And some of you have, in fact, sailed past these rock-cut tomb chambers. In fact, I sailed with some of you past these chambers in October on the Penn Alumni Tour. Uh, but these are ubiquitous in southwestern Turkey, dating to the early 4th century BC, these at the ancient site of Kaunos. And as you see, they're cut out of the rock, but they're cut in the shape of temples with columns, architraves and friezes, pediments or gables, and sculpture in those pediments. Now this is for the aristocracy, but not for the kings. For the kings, they would go one step further. They would make them freestanding, although the same basic shape. So let's just look at two of them. The so-called Nereid Monument at Xanthos and the Pericles Monument at Limira, both of which are in this general region of southwestern Turkey. And as you see, they're freestanding, loaded down with sculpture. You have friezes here and here, showing the ruler, in this case a man named Urbina, the king of Xanthos, engaged in battle and in hunt. And the inscriptions that would accompany these monuments continually emphasized those themes. The king was to be praised because of his prowess both on the battlefield and in the hunt. And so you would find these friezes used over and over again. The same sort of thing is true for the Pericles Monument in Limira, and that too has caryatids, which some of you know from the Eric Theon on the Athenian Acropolis. So this is the royal tradition as of the early fourth century BC. Tombs that look like temples, and so we call them temple tower tombs because they're raised on a large podium, they look like temples, but they're functioning as tombs. And it's from this tradition that the mausoleum of Halicarnassus comes only a few decades later. Now we don't know exactly what the mausoleum of Halicarnassus looks like. I think this is as good a guess as any at the reconstruction, but we basically have three sources for its form. One of them is Pliny from his natural history where he gives a basic description of what the monument looked like. And so it's from him that we learn that it's 140 feet high, that it's largely a square, but really more of a rectangle with two sides 120 feet long, two sides 100 feet long, so a circumference of 440 feet, 36 columns around the top, raised on a podium with a roof 
that contains 24 steps leading up to a pedestal on which was a triumphal chariot with both Mausolus and Artemisia riding in it. Now this is extraordinary. Queens didn't get to ride in their husband's triumphal chariots, except in Caria, where the queens had an unusually high level of power. So this would have been striking to anyone who came to see the monument. And we also know the architects of the monument, Pythios <coughs> and Satyros, who wrote a book about building the monument. Architects start writing books about the buildings that they're constructing as of the 6th century BC, and they continue right on down the line. So this is a, a standard component of libraries, architectural treatises, as of the beginning of the Archaic period, the Greek Archaic period. Now, how can we compare the size of the mausoleum to where we are now? The diameter of this room is 90 feet. And one of the sides, the short side of the mausoleum, would be 100 feet. So it's about the same as the diameter of this room. The height of this dome is about 32 feet. And the height of the mausoleum was 140. So you have to imagine a height that's more than four times greater than the height of the room in which you're currently seated. Although we don't know exactly what the monument looked like, we know a good deal about its sculpture because Pliny and several other ancient writers told us who the artists were who were commissioned to produce the sculptures. And we still have some of those sculptures surviving. Uh, it's clear that Mausolus and Artemisia didn't want to spare any expense, and they got the greatest sculptors they could find, those who were working in the first half of the fourth century BC. So that included Timotheus, Scopas, Leocares, and Bryaxis. They were the creme de la creme of the time. Now, we can't associate any of the sculptures with the particular hands of any of these four sculptors. What I did was to bring in uh, Roman copies of sculptures, most of these are Roman copies of sculptures that each of these men was believed to have produced. So Leda and the swan, you see the swan about to copulate with Leda. Leda, of course, would lay an egg, having just had sex with a bird, and that egg would hatch and produce Helen, soon to be Helen of Troy. So this is Timotheus. Scopas was famous for his production of Pothos, the personification of desire. Uh, Bryaxis was famous for his statue of Serapis. This is again a Roman copy, but he, uh, Serapis was an Egyptian god with whom most of you are familiar, the consort of Isis, and very popular in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. Now, Leocares, it's hard for us to associate anything with Leocares, but we're told that he did a monument for the family of Philip V, Philip, uh, Philip II, Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. And from one of these tombs in Virginia, we have five ivory heads that are believed to be miniature copies of the statues that Leo Cares uh, produced for a monument to Philip in Olympia called the Philippeion. So this is the only one that's actually 4th century BC, a small ivory head that may represent Philip II. Anyway, this gives you an idea of the kind of talent that was behind the sculptures of the mausoleum's pedestal and the, um, and the very top of the monument. So let's look at what survives. From the very top of the monument, at the top of these 24 steps, we have part of the triumphal chariot. This gives you a reproduction of what we think the triumphal chariot looked like. Again, it had to be double the usual size because it had to accommodate both Mausolus and Artemisia. And you see one of the horses still surviving. We have another horse too, even though it's lost its head. So we have a good bit surviving from the central chariot group. Unlike most chariot groups, this one was marble. And so it's more likely that marble will survive than bronze. Bronze is often melted down in late antiquity. Sometimes marble is burned also in late antiquity. Uh, it will turn into lime. You can use that as an ingredient of the concrete that you need to use to build the new early Christian churches. But all in all, marble has a higher survival rate than bronze. And so we're lucky that they did the quadriga or the, uh, the chariot in, uh, in marble rather than bronze. 
Now, for the statues that I showed you before, it's likely that these were positioned between the columns at the top of the pedestal. There were 36 of them. So the fact that we have two statues doesn't mean these are Mausolus and Artemisia. It means we have two of the 36 members of the family. So somewhere in the family were these two statues. They could represent Mausolus and Artemisia, but there's no way for us to be able to tell. These were colossal. So I put in an image that shows you what they would look like with human scale. Three meters high, that would be over 10 feet high. And remember, all of these would have been garishly painted. All ancient sculpture was garishly painted. In many cases, too garish for our tastes. So you can imagine these really shining out like a beacon as one approached the mausoleum. And then we have evidence for three different groups of statues. Uh, a fight between the Athenians and the Amazons. You see two of the Amazons here. These warrior women from the land of the steppes, about whom I'll say more in a minute. A centauromachy, these uh, mythical creatures who were half horse, half man, uh, who fought the Greeks. And then a group that features a man on horseback in trousers. And it's hard for us to associate him with a particular theme. M men in trousers did a lot of things in antiquity. They primarily are shown trousered in the hunt and in battle. So if we have a scene that shows Greeks fighting Trojans, the Trojans would be shown wearing trousers. Trousers are shorthand for Eastern origin. Or it could be a hunting scene, because since Mausolus was in alliance with the Persian king, you'll often find members of the entourage wearing Persian clothes. That means trousers. So this is a battle or a hunt, we can't say. But the Amazons, the centaurs, are clear. And the coffers of the ceiling showed the deeds of Theseus, the great Athenian hero who, like Heracles, rid the world of demons and monsters. Now, I said I'd say another word about the Amazons, because these have been so much in the news in the last couple decades. Amazon amikis, or fights between Athenians and Amazons, were incredibly popular motifs for funerary decoration. We find battle and war and death consistently united in these ancient monuments dedicated to, um, to kings. So it's not surprising that we have it here. But what about the Amazons? Who were they? Did they really exist? Some of you will have read the recent book by Adrienne Meyer on Amazons, the warrior women of the steppes, where she goes into the Amazonian tradition in some detail. So the Amazons we know about primarily from Greek literature. And Amazon is not a Greek word, but the Greeks tried to make sense of it. And the only way they could make sense of it was to separate it into two words, amastos, without a breast. Think of mastectomy. It's the same uh, root. And so they assumed, because of that, that the Amazons cut off one of their breasts so as to be able to get the quiver off the shoulder faster, which doesn't make any sense, really. But that was what they continually described in their literature, even though in depictions of the Amazons, they're always shown with two breasts. They were reportedly heavily tattooed. They lived in kingdoms that were matriarchal, no men, and they fought like men. And do we have any evidence for this? We, in fact, have plenty of evidence for it. On the northern coast of the Black Sea and also in the Altai region, especially in the region where Russia and China and Mongolia and Kazakhstan all come together, we have plenty of graveyards. In some of those graveyards, as many as 37% of the graves are those of, quote unquote, warrior women. These are women um, generally between the ages of 16 and 30 who were buried with their weapons, with bows and arrows and spears and lances, and they've clearly led a difficult life. So here's one of them. This woman is um, in her 20s. She was in her 20s, um, and she dates to the 5th century BC, and you see these pointed battle axes that have hammered holes in her skull. So that's what these are intended to uh, conjure up. And then her rib bones have been slashed by a sword. So as you look at these bodies, you can see that the women were engaged 
in heavy combat, and the weapons with which they're buried are almost certainly the weapons that they used in life. So there seems to be something to this story of the Amazons. There's no reason to believe they cut off one breast. Some of them clearly were tattooed, um, but tattooing was a very common thing in antiquity. I mean, you find, obviously, uh, with our, our students, even with the director of this museum, there are plenty of tattoos. But uh, there were as well, and Julian Siggers would be the first to talk about the methodology of those tattoos in antiquity, because he used the tool tools that had been found on Utsi the Iceman, who was a tattooed man, beginning of the third millennium BC, um, to uh, tattoo himself. So that's a kind of experimental archaeology that few would have been brave enough to attempt. Yet another indication of the prowess of our museum director. But this is all a footnote to the Amazon. So there is something to these figures. Uh, it's clear that there were stories of travelers who would come from the steppe land, from the area on the northern coast of the Black Sea, and gradually those stories developed into these larger stories of the one-breasted warrior women um, from the depths of, of southern Russia. Now, what about the sarcophagus of Mausolus? We don't have it. The tomb was looted. At some point in antiquity, we don't know when. So the sarcophagus, the stone coffin in which Mazolus' body would have been positioned, has disappeared. We know how elaborate these sarcophagi were because we have them from other royal burials. Many of you have seen this in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, the so-called sarcophagus of Alexander the Great. Now, this is not the sarcophagus of Alexander the Great. Although Alexander the Great is depicted on it, you see him here in battle with a lion skin headdress, so as a kind of surrogate Heracles or Hercules. And you also see here the extent of the paint that still survives on some of these sarcophagi. Um, this was the sarcophagus of a king named Abdalonimos, who may well have known Alexander, may well have worked with him. And it also features scenes of battle and hunt. Again, those two themes are used over and over again. So it's not unlikely, we always thought, that the sarcophagus of Mazolus would be something like this. Now recently, there's been a new discovery, just in the last few years, that's given us a better idea of what that sarcophagus might have looked like. I mentioned that the first capital of Caria was Milasa, which is right next to Halicarnassus, right next to Bodrum. And the main temple of Milasa was of Zeus, Zeus Karios, Zeus the Carian. You see that temple here with a column topped by a stork's nest. Columns are so frequently uh, the desired spot for storks to make their nests. So you go to Turkey, you see a column. Chances are good that on top of that column will be a stork and, uh, and her nest. So what happened was that looters, robbers, bought the house next to this temple thinking that if they, this would never have occurred to me or any other archaeologist, but that in some respects the looters are cleverer than, cleverer than we are. The looters dug down through the floor of the house, through the basement. They literally brought in drilling equipment and created a shaft. You can see the scalloped edges created by the drill. As they drilled down 12 meters, that's 40 feet, in the basement of the house next to the temple of Zeus. And so this is the top of the shaft. This is the bottom of the shaft. When they came out, they found themselves in a barrel vaulted chamber in which was an extraordinary and giant sarcophagus. Clearly, judging by the size, the sarcophagus of a member of the royal family of the Hecatomnids. In fact, given the style, it looks as if the sarcophagus was made at some point in the 370s, which is when Mausolus' father, Hecatomnus, would have died. And so it's usually called the sarcophagus of Hecatomnus now because of its extraordinary size and the date at which it was produced. Now, I can only show you a little bit of it, but as you see, it was colossal, a nine-foot-long sarcophagus. That doesn't mean, by any means, that Hecatomnus was a really tall guy. The size of the sarcophagus was an index of the importance of the person buried within it. And you see here, probably, a portrait of Hecatomnus, father of Mausolus, who's reclining on a banqueting couch, holding a drinking vessel in his hand. They always hold, held it by their fingertips with servants over here 
tall and small, and then his wife seated in a chair right next to him, and then their children, conceivably, this is too small to be mausolus, but um, their children to the side. On the other side of the sarcophagus is a wonderful hunt scene, not unlike what you would find on the Alexander sarcophagus. This has not been published. The bones have not yet been analyzed as far as I know. This is literally just out of the ground. In fact, it's not even out of the ground. It's still in the chamber because it would be hard to get it out of the chamber. But it's something that we're still awaiting the public, something for which we're still awaiting the publication. There's more to come. But it's the kind of sarcophagus we can imagine having been used for Mausolus and Artemisia themselves. Now, the Persian Empire to which Mausolus owed his allegiance would evaporate in the 330s BC as Alexander began his 10-year campaign from what is now northeastern Greece all the way through Anatolia, through the Levant into Egypt, through Iraq, Iran, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Tajikistan, etc. Uh, and in the course of that campaign, the Persian Empire came to an end, and a new empire, Alexander's Empire, was established, encompassing roughly the same territory, even a little larger. And just as an in indication of Alexander's campaigns, of course, I'm showing you the Alexander mosaic from the House of the Fawn at Pompeii with Alexander on Bucephalus, always shown bareheaded as an indication of his heroism. He was so magnificent on the field, he didn't need to wear a helmet. The Roman emperors would do the same thing. And then here is his opponent, King Darius, king of the Persians, who's retreating. You can see his charioteer is whipping the horses, and they're leaving the battlefield. This probably taking place at Issus in what is now southeastern Turkey, the second of the three major battles between Alexander and the Persians. And so with this, the Carian dynasty comes to an end, and Caria and Halicarnassus become part of a much larger Hellenistic world that Alexander has produced. And in that Hellenistic world, probably in the third century BC, one of the librarians, the chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria, probably draws up our list of the seven wonders of the ancient world. A man named Callimachus, who originally came from Cyrene in what is now Libya, another site excavated under the auspices of the Penn Museum. And so in the Library of Alexandria, which you see reproduced here in a reconstruction, it's likely that they begin to make this great list of the wonders of past civilizations going into the third century BC. So there, it's a very up-to-date list because they're including the Colossus of Rhodes, which would have been made in the 280s BC. But they're trying to create an index of the greatest achievements of past civilizations. And certainly by the second half of the second century BC, we start getting these seven wonders represented in poetry. And everybody tried to, again, surpass each of the seven wonders in one way or another in subsequent generations. So we find Augustus building a monumental tomb which gradually received the name Mausoleum after Mausolus's tomb. So Mausolus's tomb was so famous that Mausoleum, which initially signified only the tomb in Halicarnassus, now came to signify any monumental tomb of a ruler, and ultimately any monumental tomb, whether it was of a ruler or a member of the aristocracy. So he builds an enormous circular tomb, not based on the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, but still getting the same name. And then that model is also followed by Hadrian, the emperor of the early second century AD, who builds an enormous, even a little larger tomb than that of Augustus, just across the Tiber River from the Mausoleum of Augustus. And many of you know this monumental Mausoleum of Hadrian because it ultimately, in the 13th century, was turned into Castel San Angelo, one of the great fortresses next to Vatican City. So this transformation of tombs into fortresses is in fact a very timely one from the point of view of this lecture because that's exactly what happened in a way to the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. So let's go back to the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. It's likely that the mausoleum continued to stand until the 13th century when there was an earthquake and then all the pieces of the mausoleum were scattered across the ground. Not as you see them now, these are the product of an excavation uh, by the Danes, but a big pile of stones where once one of the seven wonders of the ancient world had been situated. 
And into this picture come the Crusaders, the Order of the Knights of St. John. Now, many of you are familiar with the Crusaders in one way, shape, or form. The Order of the Knights of St. John, or the Knights Hospitallers, come to Jerusalem in the 12th century, ostensibly to provide medical care for the pilgrims who were visiting the Holy Land. And then in time, they provide armed escorts for the pilgrims who were visiting the Holy Land. And then they become an army in their own right. They're forced out of Jerusalem and go to Halicarnassus and to Rhodes, which is still linked to Halicarnassus, in the early 15th century, courtesy of one of the Ottoman sultans. And they decide that they need a fortress in Halicarnassus from which they can operate. This is the early 15th century. So you need a castle. It's the early 15th century. What else is in your town? A big pile of good building stone. What are you going to do? You're going to use it. And that's what they did. They built the castle of St. Peter in Halicarnassus incorporated into which were the elements of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. So you can see the columns of the mausoleum turned on their sides, other building stones of the mausoleum used in the walls of the castle and carved with crusader iconography, more drums of the columns here. The whole thing is an amalgamation of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, dedicated to St. Peter. And so it came to receive the title of Petronium, so Petronium is the castle of the Crusaders. And over time, over the intervening centuries, Petronium became Bodrum. So Bodrum, the current Turkish name of the city, is just another way of saying Castle of St. Peter, although it's something that's rarely mentioned for some reason in uh, tours of the castle. But in any event, you're now familiar with the iconography. And of course, the, the um, the Crusaders had a peripatetic existence. They're forced out of Bodrum in the 16th century by Suleiman the Magnificent. They ultimately end up in Malta. Many of you are familiar with the Crusader architecture in Malta. Then they're forced out of Malta in 1798 in the Napoleonic Wars. And now they have an office in Rome. So from a castle in Bodrum to a single office in Rome, although I've been in that office and it's pretty magnificent. But nevertheless, they're still in operation. The, the, the sign is still on the door, even though they're not doing very much. Now, what about the elements that the Crusaders didn't use in their castle? They couldn't use them all. There were too many elements. And many of them had gotten buried shortly after the earthquake. How is it that those came to be excavated, and where are they now? In order to understand this, you need, again, a brief footnote on the neoclassical movement of the 18th century. As you know, in the middle of the 18th century, we get our first big excavations, Pompeii and Herculaneum, in the middle of the 18th century. And that really captivates all of Europe, sparking a neoclassical movement that rivaled anything that had existed up to that point. And enlivening the grand tour, which involved aristocratic men, usually traveling from London to Rome to Pompeii and often to Athens and even to Constantinople to see the wonders of the ancient world and to record architecturally what was still standing at that time and also to paint what was still standing. And so we get these wonderful paintings by Panini in the middle of the 18th century with all the great wonders of ancient Rome, the Colosseum, Basilica of Maxentius, Pantheon, etc. So the world becomes fascinated anew with classical antiquity. And this is the period of the great public museums. The second half of the 18th century, the first big public museums start getting established. British Museum first, then the Vatican, then the Louvre. And in order to fill those enormous spaces, which are intended to be encyclopedic in scope, they need material. And so some of them would buy the material from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, like Lord Elgin who went to Athens, where, of course, the uh, Parthenon was still in relatively good shape. And from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, who had political jurisdiction over that area at that time in the late 18th century, he bought the Parthenon sculptures, which ultimately came to be called the Elgin Marbles, and which are now in the British Museum. 
but sales from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire wouldn't fill these enormous galleries that had been created by these great empires of Europe. They needed excavation. And so this marks the period of a wave of new excavations. It's not just Pompeii and Herculaneum, but in the 19th century, we get more and more big excavations with the intent of finding sculpture and architecture that could be brought back to the sponsoring museum and fill its galleries. And so in that context, Charles Newton, in the third quarter of the 19th century, whom you see here, goes to Halicarnassus and starts digging and finds a phenomenal number of sculptures and pieces of the architecture. You see one of the colossal lions that uh, decorated the mausoleum of Halicarnassus here. Th around the mausoleum, and I should have said this earlier, there seems to have been a, a, a row of colossal lions. How exactly they were situated we're not entirely sure, but he found a number of them in the course of his excavations and brought them back to the British Museum, where they occupied a different gallery from those of the Parthenon, but a gallery that they shared with the Nereid Monument at Xanthos, which I showed you a little earlier. The great wonders of ancient Anatolia now became, in a way, a subset of the British Empire, and the same sort of thing was true with the Louvre and with France. Now what, meanwhile, has been happening to the castle of the Knights of St. John? This takes us up to the modern period. Obviously, when the Crusaders vacated it, it stayed unoccupied for a certain period of time, occupied off and on. When I went to Bodrum for the first time in 1980, there was a disco right next to it. So the castle had become the setting for a disco, but now, of course, it is the center of the Museum of Underwater Archaeology, and many of you have visited the museum. As you know, that museum was largely planned and installed by George Bass, a PhD from Penn, former curator of the Mediterranean section at Penn, and generally regarded as the founder of underwater archaeology. So that has become the focus of the castle. I want to close by simply reminding you of the influence of the great wonders of the ancient world in later society. And let's start again with the Colossus of Rhodes, with which I began the lecture in showing you the Statue of Liberty. This is 110 feet high, the Colossus of Rhodes. Uh, as you know, it only lasted a few decades, not more than four or five decades, and then it's down. But it was renowned in the ancient world. And so in the 60s AD, just after 64, Nero, the Emperor Nero, builds a colossal statue of himself as the sun god of identical dimensions to the Colossus of Rhodes. So this too was 110 feet high because it was intended to match that of the Colossus of Rhodes. And both of them have the same kind of solar crown, which you also saw on the Statue of Liberty. We get the same concept of a colossal image of the sun god, a ruler communing with the sun, in modern ruler iconography, even if the actual format isn't identical. So some of you, perhaps, are thinking of the statue of Sapar Morat Niyazov in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan, <laughs> which is the most recent uh, monument to have been influenced by the Colossus of Rhodes. As you see, it's not the same format, but you have the ruler of Turkmenistan, now deceased, the ruler of Turkmenistan with his arms raised and it's motorized so that as the sun moves across the sky, so too does the statue, so that the sun always shines in the hands of uh, Niyazov, of Turkmenbasha. So it's again this connection between the ruler and the sun god that we find established already in the Hellenistic period and powerfully evoked in the Colossus of Nero. Of course, many of you are familiar with the influence of the statue of Zeus Olympios, one of the other seven wonders of the ancient world, on modern American ruler iconography. So this embarrassing composition <laughs> of George Washington is not often shown to you by the city fathers of Washington, but it is George Washington as Zeus of Olympia. There's no mistaking it. Now, Washington died, obviously, before this statue was made, and people were horribly embarrassed when it was produced, but it gives you an idea of the enduring influence of these templates that formed part of the group of Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. Now, we don't know, as I say, exactly what the mausoleum looked like. Everybody has a different idea 
uh, as to what its um, original composition, its original configuration uh, looked like. So this is one, this is another, this is a third. I could show you 10 or 15 more, each of which varies in details because we only have Pliny and the sculpture in the sculpture and the architectural elements in the castle of St. John and what's in the British Museum to go on. That's all we have. So all of the reconstructions are gonna look a little different and the buildings that have been influenced by the mausoleum by extension are gonna look a little different. The mausoleum serves as a template primarily for war memorials and for tombs. So you know it from the World War I monument in Indianapolis which is perhaps closest to the mausoleum. You can see the steps leading up to the podium. Grant's tomb is perhaps the furthest from it, but the architect was aiming for a reconstruction of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, as was the designer of the World War I memorial in Melbourne, which also has the steps leading up to a podium. So a variety of types based on a variety of reconstructions, since again, we don't quite know uh, what it looked like. The mausoleum also shows up in a variety of portable media commissioned by nations that want to be viewed as the eighth wonder of the world. So if you want to present yourself as the equal or more than the equal, someone or something that has surpassed the achievements evoked by the seven wonders of the ancient world, one thing you can do is to, is to uh, print a series of stamps of the seven wonders of the ancient world and yourself or strike a series of coins of the seven wonders of the ancient world and yourself. And we find that done repeatedly, more often than you'd think. So this is Hungary, which has done the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. They even include a map. This is the Congo. This is Mongolia. This was done, and this, these are parts of series of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So not only the mausoleum that they've done, they've done all seven of them. Um, Mongolia after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and the Congo after a military coup, when they were seeking some stability and a better marketing program, and how better to market yourself than as the successor to the seven wonders of the ancient world. And as I say, we find that on coins too. This one, um, one of a whole series of seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, struck by the Ivory Coast in 2008. And so these are far more common than you would expect, and they're intended to, to be status builders by nations that feel that their status could be augmented in one way, shape, or form. And we also see them cited in reference to modern buildings. So if you go into the lobby of the Empire State Building, which as you know was presented, marketed, as the eighth wonder of the world in 1931 when it was unveiled, if you go into the lobby, you'll see stained glass windows of the seven, oops, sorry, of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Not all of them are very faithful replicas, but you see the mausoleum over here. Here's the Colossus of Rhodes, statue of Zeus at Olympia, etc. The idea is that the statue, that the uh, Empire State Building is the equal of all of these great constructions of the past. And as I said, the mausoleum or the uh, the Empire State Building build itself as the eighth wonder of the world. And we consistently find this number eight showing up over and over again, as if to say that these monuments are the next, the next, the successor to the greatness of antiquity. So that would include the, uh, the Houston Astrodome, the highway from Pakistan to uh, China, the colossal statue of Vulcan just outside Birmingham, Alabama, which perhaps has the weakest claim to the eighth wonder of the ancient world. And you even find it showing up in the movies. So King Kong in 1933, this is only two years after the Empire State Building said, we are the eighth wonder of the, of the world. Uh, you'll find it penetrating Hollywood just as quickly. These lists are in flux. They're not static. I've been referring to a canonical seven wonders of the ancient world, but those lists, the components of those lists change over time. So in the medieval period, they did it again, figuring that maybe a better choice could be made of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So that included Great Wall of China, Hagia Sophia, the Colosseum. Another list of the seven wonders of the medieval world included the Ark of the Covenant and Solomon's Temple. So as I say, there's a great deal of flux and we keep finding new lists that are created. So this is the newest one in 2007. 
Actually, it's not the newest one. It's the penultimate one, 2007, where we get Chichen Itza, which will be uh, the next lecture that you hear, as well as Machu Picchu and the Colosseum. And then the last of these lists, there's always seven, uh, unless you have the eighth, but um, you start out with seven. The, the latest of the seven wonders of the world, as you see, goes into the 21st century with the channel, the Golden Gate Bridge, here again, the Empire State Building, Panama Canal, etc. So what are these lists really that are continually cited, that have been cited, and rearranged and reconfigured for 2,300 years? They're essentially a summary of the variety and power of human achievement, so striking that they confer upon the builder a power and a status far greater than that of their competitors, than the nations and cities with which they compete. And simultaneously, they create a new standard of excellence that every nation feels compelled to meet or surpass, thereby proving to themselves and their citizens that the world is still full of wonder. Thank you for listening to me tonight, and thank you for your support of the museum.